Would you stand with me this morning for this morning's Bible reading? We will first be going to Jeremiah and then into Luke. Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from, the, from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. In the sixth month, and sorry, in Luke 1, 26, 38, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a, a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be, to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Please take a seat. I wonder if I could get you to engage for a little bit uh, and just turn to the person next to you and just this, this Christmas, um, Christmas is a, a, a time of hope. Um, and so would you just, uh, for all you introverts, I know you love this part, but would you just kind of turn, it will be brief, um, but what are you hoping for this Christmas? Go, turn, I know, on the spot. Okay, I'm going to bring you back in. Bring you back, yes. It sounds like that list is very long. So I, I, wonder, I wonder, just, just wondering, what were some of the, the shout-outs? Just shout out some of the things that you're hoping for, or maybe the person next to you was hoping for, if it's embarrassing. Ooh, nice one. Peace between family. Peace between family was that one. Any others? Now you're all kind of hesitant. Oh, sorry. Arrest. Arrest. Yes, good. Good. Safe arrival of grandchildren. Safe arrival of That's good. Now I wonder, I wonder, you probably heard those ones and you were like, iPhone. No. <laughs> we're not doing those ones. Okay. <laughs> but I wonder if, if you know, because as you come into Christmas, you do, you have your, you kind of have your list of things. You're like, I, I hope. Like that, those, those things that you're hoping for. You, maybe you are hoping for that new, that new iPhone or that new car smell. Or as you come to the end, you're coming to the end of the work year and you are just hoping for the summer holiday. Maybe you're like me and you're hoping your child will learn to clean up after themselves. Um, <laughs> But perhaps, perhaps you're hoping for, 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 for beautiful things. You're hoping, I mean, good things that will help your, your whānau. You're hoping for that job promotion that you've been working so hard for, you've sacrificed so much for. 
Maybe, maybe you're hoping that you will find that special someone. Or maybe you're hoping that you'll finally fall pregnant. Maybe you're hoping that there will be reconciliation within family. We start to get deeper. And the hopes become harder and pull on your heartstrings more and more. You're hoping that the end of this year will bring an end to the problems that you faced in 2024. And 2025 will see the resolution of all these things. Next year, my hopes will be fulfilled. Um, Mel and I, uh, for those that don't know me, Mel is my wife. Um, this was us. When we arrived and we were welcomed into this church, Pano, those were our boys, uh, seven, seven months and two years old. Um, yeah, it's crazy. And we arrived, we, we first arrived here on these shores uh, December 9, 2019. And so I, I for the, I, most of you know, but those who don't know, I was called to be associate pastor here. Um, and we, we, one of the things that we, when we came early, I remember thinking we're going to miss Christmas with our family. Um, but that's okay, because in 2020, we'll be back to have Christmas with our family. And, and it will be great because I've done a year of, of, of kind of just finally getting to realize what pastoral ministry is like. Um, in March of 2020, as many of you would know, we went into COVID lockdowns. And we didn't make it back to Australia to see our families until Christmas of 2022. Um, three years after moving here to New Zealand. And what we had hoped for looked completely different to what we had experienced. And there was, a, there was a deferred longing. We had to sit in this. And yet, far from God being absent, God was at work. And I think one of the things that... So in our opening reading in Jeremiah, um, we, we enter... It doesn't sound like it in what we've read, but what we actually enter is this sobering scene from, from the Jer prophet Jeremiah's day. So he, at this point, is imprisoned in, in the court of the guard, and, and Jeremiah is prophesying to the city of Jerusalem, which is under threat from the Babylonian army, one of the greatest armies the world had ever known. We're sitting outside their walls about to tear them down. And there was no, there's no diplomacy really at that time. It's, it's conquered and be fully conquered. You will likely have family die. They are on the brink of destruction and families, families are falling apart. There's some horrific other details about what families were actually doing and even resorting to some cannibalism. And, and, the, and, worse, like, and, and kind of even compounding on it was the nation, when they looked to their king to lead them, he was weak, he was impotent, indecisive. And, and they, the, these, they had grown up with this identity that they were God's chosen people. God would use them to be a blessing to all the other nations. And yet here they were, and this identity Seemingly shattered. Things were far from going as planned. Nowhere near what was hoped for. And yet, it's into this bleak and desolate scene that the prophet Jeremiah, surrounded by death and destruction, dared to speak these words of life and declared, The days are coming, says the Lord. When I, when God will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah in those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line and he will do what is just and right in the land. Can you imagine hearing these words as everything is falling apart around you? A righteous branch, an image of life and of hope breaking forth from the seemingly dead stump of David's line. It's as if God was saying, this, what you are experiencing right now, I know it's, it's, it's horrible. It's devastating. 
It feels like the end, but this is not the end. I will bring life where there is death. I will bring restoration where there is ruin. I will bring justice where there's injustice. But I think this is one of the the key things that we have to note. Because sometimes I think we can get caught up in our own world and we think it's just happening to me. But one thing that we have to note here is, is that this promise was not fulfilled in their time. The city was conquered. The people who had heard Jeremiah's word still then had to endure years of exile and hardship. And they longed, longed for the day when God's promise would come to pass. And when it did, though, it was nothing like what they could have foreseen or expected. In fact, it was nearly 600 years later that, this, that this, this unfulfilled hope had been handed down from generation to generation until the words of Jeremiah came to pass in the most unexpected way through a young woman named Mary, whose obedience opened the way for the branch that would sprout from David's line to be fulfilled. And, and, and not some abstract idea, but a person. Jesus Christ, who would step into humanity, God in flesh, stepping into human history to bring justice and righteousness. And again, not as anyone would have expected. Because I think the thought would have been, at least you see in, in the Gospels, is this expectation that the coming Messiah, that is what they, the, the branch would be, that this descendant of David, David, the Messiah, the Christ, would bring justice and righteousness through military might. That he would set everything right. That the Messiah would arrive in glory and prestige. That there would be trumpet sounds and every knee would bow. But then, that's not the story that we read every year at Christmas time. However, I think sometimes when we read the story at Christmas time, we kind of hear the details. But I think, but we 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 sort of sanitize them. We airbrush uh, the story with snowy backgrounds. And even though we live in the southern hemisphere, I mean, it rains, um, but not snowy. It's not a white Christmas. And we craft into it this serene scene of silent nights, singing angels. Angels never are said to sing in Scripture, by the way. Um, barns filled with hay that actually are just, it's way more comfortable than any hotel king bed that you can imagine. Right? We, we just think, oh, Jesus was just laying in a beautiful hay. No, spiky. Have you ever laid in hay? Itchy as. And then, and then not to mention this, the animals there, surrounded by cows and sheep or whatever it would have been. But we kind of go like a little spring sheep. Bah, and it's beautiful. There would have been poo, wee. It's disgusting. We imagine sheep that don't smell. Any farmers? Anyone who knows? Yep. This, we, we imagine a context that actually wasn't there. That the branch of David was actually born into the circumstances into which the Messiah entered into. The true story of Christmas tells us that things were not well. Things were not good. The fulfillment of hope did not come in the way that many had expected, nor did it erase the difficulties that surrounded his arrival. As we read the story of Christmas, we hear of such overcrowded towns where even a pregnant woman who's on the verge of birth is shunted out into the cold. And that would have been cold there. We read of a king who was so insecure, so power hungry, that upon hearing that a new baby king had been born, then orders that all boys under the age of two be massacred in Bethlehem. The promise spoken in Jeremiah of a righteous king is fulfilled in Jesus. But God's plan comes to fruition in the midst of oppression, chaos, and personal upheaval. 
But then we think, but surely, surely, God, you know, if you're going to be with anyone, if anyone's life would improve, surely it would be the woman who would give birth to the Messiah. Right? Surely. But as we turn to the story of Mary that we've just read in Luke 1, we see how the promise of the Messiah enters into the life of this young woman and completely flips it upside down. In fact, we see how her faithfulness was required in the midst of such uncertainty. Social ostracism, oppression under a foreign occupation, and fear for her life, for her husband's life, for her newborn baby's life. But let's zoom in on that interaction that we've read about between Mary and the angel Gabriel, because I think there's a couple things that are really important here. We read that, and he came, the angel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Imagine that, you're like an angel comes to you glowing, um, not singing because they don't sing, um, but glowing and or whatever it is, however they appeared. And she's like, oh no, what does this mean? Mary's immediate response is one of concern. And I love this because it invites us to have our concerns and our doubts and our fears when it comes to trusting God and placing our hope in Him. And I think it touches on something that the ancient Israelites, they knew and they understood that when God comes, the enemy will also come to attack. The enemy, Satan doesn't want us to thrive in God's goodwill. There will be opposition. And so I think what Mary taps into there is an awareness of, okay, things are about to get real. And then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. She would have this, the Jeremiah prophecy, in the back of her mind. She would have known as the angel speaking, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. My best guess is that Mary was probably hoping for a normal life. A little family. You know, Joseph, he, he's, a, he's a builder. He's a stable income. Local community where everybody knows each other, we'll help each other out. We know each other's names, even that one. But then there comes an angel saying, salvation is coming through you, and it disrupts everything. But look, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Let that sink in. How does this align, this this announcement completely disrupts her life? But this is God's favor. See, here's the thing. I think we, we, we long for security, right? This is why we have insurances. This is why we need, we, need all of, uh, we need our jobs. We need our houses. We need all the different things to make sure that our lives are safe and secure. And, 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 we, and we, think that for some, we, we think that if God would just give me more favor, then everything would be all right. Having read this, what do you, what do you think? How, who's afraid to ask God for favor now? I think one of the things that we learn from this passage is that favor from God does not equal favors from God. Favor from God does not equal that everything is going to be great and fine and lovely. Again, remember the contested part that I was talking about. And I love it though, because again, like God, God he's, he's like, come, wrestle, ask the questions. And Mary, Mary then asks a question. She's kind of like, okay, yep, maybe there's a way out of this still. How will this be? Since I'm a virgin, it's impossible. It's not, it's not just improbable, it's impossible, God, so it can't happen, right? But then the angel responds with four assurances. 
One, this is not an act of man. This is not a human act, but an act of the Holy Spirit who, who can do these things. God has already done, number two, God has already done the impossible by giving Mary's far too old cousin a child. In fact, she's six months along. Three, God is the God of the impossible. When it seems like there is no possible way, God finds a way. For God is faithful. It may not turn out how we thought. It may not look as we planned. But God is faithful to his promises. His promise 600 years ago, he is faithful to in this moment. We need to hold that as we continue because Mary's response is beautiful. The favor of God is about to do her no favors from a human standpoint. But in beautiful faith and surrender, she speaks these words. I am the Lord. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Think about what Mary was agreeing to here. She was consenting to a divine plan that would radically alter her life. She would face misunderstanding, ridicule, and likely accusations of immorality. She would risk her future marriage to Joseph and her reputation in her community. As we read on, when she tells Joseph, Joseph initially thinks about trying to separate from her quietly. Lastly, she would raise a child. Simeon later prophesies, a sword will pierce your your own soul too. He says this to her. Mary would raise a child destined to suffer and die. Yet in the midst of all of this, Mary chose to hope, to endure, to trust she, she, she didn't, at that point, she doesn't demand any more answers. She didn't ask for any guarantees that everything would turn out the way that she wanted. Instead, she said yes to God's plan because she trusted that he was faithful to his promises, that he was the God of the impossible, even when his ways did not make sense to her. Mary's response teaches us profound truths about hope. Firstly, hope requires trust in God's character. All throughout the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, you see them encouraging to repeat the promises and the character of God to your children. Build in them a deep trust of God's character. Mary's faith wasn't rooted in her ability to understand the full scope of God's plan. It was rooted in her belief that God is faithful and good that his love endures forever. His promises are true. Mary teaches us that hope isn't about the absence of struggle. Her life didn't suddenly become easier because of her faithfulness. It became harder. The arrival of the Messiah didn't erase her challenges. It gave her the strength and purpose to face them. Mary teaches us that hope leads to surrender, to complete submission to God. Her response, let it be to me according to your word, is such an intense act of surrender. It's a prayer of yielding to God's will even when his will is going to be costly. Jeremiah teaches us that hope is is not about quick fixes or instant gratification. Hope is rooted in the faithfulness of God's promises, even when they take longer to be fulfilled than we would like, even when they're beyond our time. Will we trust God? The the people of, of, of Judah, of Jerusalem, had to cling to the promise of God that he had not abandoned them, even when their circumstances seemed to suggest otherwise. Mary teaches us that hope isn't found within the absence of fear or challenges, but in those moments, 
through the trustworthiness of God who keeps his promises. And, and this is the thing. It's, it's not a passive hope. I think sometimes we just think if I just sleep and I'll wake up and it'll be better. 2025 will be better. There is, there is a, there's an intentionality in Mary's hope. A courageous trust in God even when we don't understand his plans fully. Through these lives, we witness that the hope of the Messiah came into the world, into a world not of peace and ease, but marked by chaos, struggle, and injustice. And the beautiful thing that we can cling to in all this is that the God who worked in the worst and most unexpected situations is the same God who works today in our lives, in your life. You see, this is why we can have hope in God. God had not abandoned Judah as they were besieged by Babylon. He was there in their midst, speaking through the faithful remnant, crying out for his people to turn to him in hope, in faith. And even when they didn't, even when they were unfaithful, he remained faithful. And promised to fulfill the good promise that he had made to the people of Israel and Judah. A promise he would fulfill in the quiet town of Bethlehem. When Jesus Christ was born. Born to a young woman named Mary. Whose life was utterly flipped upside down. But who was there? Who was there? God. Emmanuel. God with us in the pain and suffering, hardship and disruption. All these things, these these are not foreign to God. And yet he is present in it all. And he is present with you today, tomorrow and every day. In the planned and the unplanned, in the predictable and the messy. See, this is, this is the encouragement that God doesn't just choose to go, okay, when everything's sorted, I think we have, this th- we have this theology when we think that everything's sorted, then we can talk to God about it. No, he's over here in the mess with you in that moment saying, turn to me. I'm here. Jesus, the righteous branch, who not only was born into a world of chaos and oppression, but then lives so that he may die an unjust death on a cross, on a Roman torture device to bring the ultimate justice and righteousness to the world, to fulfill the promises of God and do what is just and right in the land. The one promised in Jeremiah, carried by Mary, gave his life to secure the hope of the world and then promises to be with us until the end of the age. Who then sends the Holy Spirit to counsel, to comfort, and to form us through all of life's up and downs. God, in his great love, steps into our mess. For you and me, he steps into our brokenness, into our unfulfilled plans. And he says, this is not the end of the story pain and the suffering and the death that we often seem to have, they are not the fi- they do not have the final say. Christmas is a time of hope. Beautiful hope. Because the birth of Jesus points us to the cross. And the, the moment that Jesus laid his life down to redeem us, And that moment points us to his resurrection where he overcomes and triumphs over sin and death. And then it points us forward still to the day when he will return to make all things new. On that day, death, grief, crying and pain will be no more. For the old order will have passed away and God will make everything new. The question that we are faced with Not just today, but every day. Because this is a choice that we have to make. It's not passive. It's active. That just as Jeremiah and Mary, just as they had to, as we wait, will we trust God today?
where we hope in his promises despite our fears and our uncertainties? Will we surrender our plans and trust that God is faithful to fulfill his word? This was God's invitation to hope to Jeremiah, to Israel, to Judah, to Mary, and it is for you and me today. So, just a couple questions. God's invitation to hope for you today that I want us to think on, depending on where you're at at the moment. What is one area of your life If you can think of multiple, then bring that. Where God is inviting you to surrender to him in hope that his way is best. But perhaps you're in a good space. Perhaps you're filled with joy coming into this season. Amazing, what a gift. So how can you embody the hope of God for someone else who isn't in this Advent season? Now, I've got a couple ways that I'm just going to list off. And feel free to write them down, watch it again, ignore them. But I want to encourage us. And this is number one, encourage others. Who can you reach out to? Who do you know is struggling at the moment? Who can you reach out to with words of encouragement or support? A text message, a phone call. Go see them for a coffee. Who can we serve? How 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 can we serve those in need in this time? It is. It is so crazy and busy, as Murray said. But what if we were to put down something, to come tonight to abide and just to worship and then Holy Spirit speak, and in that space, God will instruct you, give you a person that's on your mind, a space that you can enter into. Maybe it's, it's um, uh, oh no, sorry, Christmas for a heart, heart for a Christmas. Heart for Christmas. Heart to Christmas. Christmas from the heart. Um, down at 24, uh, 24 7. Oh my goodness. Come on, Matt. Vision West. How, how, we, we are in a community that needs, but I'm sure we all know one person. How can we advocate for justice, seeking equality, seeking peace? How can you open your home and your heart, inviting others in, creating an environment not of entertainment, but of hospitality? What if you were to invite someone or someone's to your house for Christmas, for their lunch or for dinner? That yes, it's, this is the family time, but who doesn't have family at this time? And this is the hard one. Share the gospel. Because somewhere along the line, we've forgotten that this hope that we have is grounded, it, it begun because we heard it. It's not just because we saw someone encouraging someone or serving someone or advocating for justice. All those things are incredible things and ways that we get to reveal the hope of Jesus in our lives. But we saw, we heard someone, whether your parents or a friend or someone. We want our lives to reflect the hope in Jesus, but we also have to be prepared to share the message of Christ's hope. To our families, to our friends, to our neighbors and colleagues. Who's in your mind right now? Christmas is such an incredible opportunity. So we need to take it. And lastly, pray for others. Pray. If you're fearful, pray. If you're going to do it, but you're like, I don't know what to say, but I'm going to do it anyway, pray. We've just done a series on prayer. Walk with God. Be with God. In how we live this out. Lift up others, but also bring yourself to God. As we come together and lay our hardship, our losses, and our challenges at his feet. Demonstrating the hope through our own faith, even in difficult circumstances. It's a way that we live with hope. The same God who fulfilled his promises to Jeremiah and Mary invites us to hope. As we celebrate this Christmas season, this Advent season, let us hold fast to the hope that we have in Jesus as we wait for his return. And this morning we are going to have communion and I'd just like to invite the elders 
uh, and their spouses to come and to hand out the elements, um, if they could do that now. And as we come to the Lord's table, I want us to reflect on this hope that we have in Jesus, a hope that is secure because of his promises that are faithful thousands of years ago, are faithful today. His life and his death and resurrection are just as life-changing, altering, transforming today as they were 2,000 years ago. Because God is faithful. Communion is a moment of surrender and hope. It's a time to lay down our fears and uncertainties, trusting in the faithfulness of God who invites us to hope in Him today. As we partake in the bread and the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until He comes, anchoring our lives in the promise that this is not the end. The pain, the chaos, the struggle, whatever it is, is not the final word. Jesus is. So in your own time, we'll have some time of silent contemplative reflection. And then the band will will move us into sung worship. But as you take the bread, remember his body broken for you. As you drink the cup, remember his blood shed for you. And as you do... Let this be an act, an embodied act of trust and surrender, a reminder of his invitation to hope and a declaration of his love and faithfulness. Holy Spirit, would you just come? Fill us with an awareness of you. Fill our minds with a deeper grasp of the hope that we have in you. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray.